Our next speaker is uh, Tim Alto. Tim is an assistant professor in University of Washington Allen School. He focuses on developing computational methods for large-scale data to extract uh, actionable insights. Among several research awards, he has been awarded with CKDD Dissertation Award. Tim, we are looking forward to your wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear and see me OK? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, I, I want to start by by, by thanking uh, Mega Wolfgang, all the organizers, the entire team behind it for for the invitation. Um, it's it's a great honor to to follow such such great work and, and such great speakers, and I, I very much enjoyed learning about everybody's work uh, as well as the really kind of uh, I think very lively and interactive Q and A, uh, which is awesome, and I, I very much look forward to. Um, let me try to figure out how to zoom. Uh, how, how to use Teams to share my slides here. Um, I think you're muted right now, Mega. So you will see a share content button next to the leave button. Do you see my slides? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, um, welcome everybody. Uh, it's so great to be with you all. Um, I'm I'm actually at the I'm at the University of Washington, where I direct the Behavioral Data Science Group, which means I'm in, in Seattle on the West Coast in the US. So it's a bit earlier over here. I appreciate you all staying a little late in, in Germany uh, and allowing us to connect. Um, um, given that the the European Soccer Championship is starting very soon, I'm actually very very thankful for the opportunity to get on uh, back on German time. Um, all right, um, so what, what I want to talk about today is um, how how we might be able to use AI for empathy in mental health support. And um, I want to start by just acknowledging that um, everything I'm going to uh, show you is, is really the work of a much bigger team, uh, including uh, my students Ashish and Inna, as well as clinical psychology collaborators, um, Adam and Dave, as well as different uh, platforms uh, such as Talk Life that we've been um, very um, grateful to, to be able to work with. Um, I also want to start with a content warning. Uh, the presentation today um, will it contain some examples related to self-harm and suicidal ideation. Um, we use those examples only to illustrate really what, what's kind of in, in the data, what's what's in, in the world and, and, and what we're really trying to address. Um, and of course, we have ensured that all these uh, uh, examples are appropriately anonymized. So um, what's the main motivation behind this world, uh, be, behind this work? Um, unfortunately, um, access to, to mental health care really is very poor. And unfortunately, it's poor across the globe, uh, almost no matter where you look. And um, there's huge, uh, huge problems to, to get uh, mental health care. And one thing that really struck me is that we might never have enough mental health professional to take care of everybody, especially as the need is, is increasing um, in, in general over the last uh, decade or so, and, and especially over the, the recent pandemic as well. We know how many people are being trained and, and, and we know that there's kind of not any time soon will we actually have enough people. Um, this is where at least for some conditions and situations, online peer support platforms can come in. Um, because of stigma, um, cost, and, and other access barriers, millions of people actually use online platforms to, to seek and provide support. Um, we've been working with TalkLife. Um, you see kind of a screenshot of, of their app here on the right. Um, uh, people will, will go there, share what they're struggling with, and, and they can interact with others and get support. And there's many other platforms like that as well. Now, um, a key component uh, for providing effective and successful mental health support is empathy. Empathy is the ability to understand or feel uh, the emotions and experiences of others. Um, uh, here's an example. Um, say somebody shares that they're struggling um, and certainly are perceiving that their whole family hates uh, them. Um, one way to respond empathically might be to say, oh, if that happened to me, I think I would feel really isolated. Um, um, do you feel that way? Kind of in interpreting what the other person is going through. And 
uh, empathic interactions have a really strong effect in mental health. Um, there's countless studies that have shown that these type of interactions have strong associations with positive counseling outcomes, and they help us um, build better relationships, which uh, psychologists would often call alliance or, or rapport. Now, um, empathy is a very complex, nuanced con uh, concept, uh, and we'll talk about it today. Um, and expressing empathy requires a lot of expertise and training. Now, these peer supporters on these platforms are absolutely amazing. They, they kind of come there and volunteer their time and energy to, and want to help others. Um, however, they're also typically untrained, um, and we find that highly empathic conversations are fairly rare. Um, for example, um, a post you might find are, are people responding something like, try talking to your friends. Um, that's uh, suggesting an action and uh, kind of telling the other person what they might uh, do. Uh, you will find that uh, professionals very rarely will do something like this. Um, and the, the kind of primary question behind this work is, how can we empower these peer supporters to provide more effective support? They're amazing people, they're highly motivated to help others. How can we help them be more effective at this goal? Um, so for example, what could we do to take, um, to take kind of the, the types of responses we're currently seeing and uh, transforming them and helping people express empathy more effectively? And um, everything that I'm going to talk about today will be about how to use uh, AI machine learning based systems to help and kind of empower these peer supporters to express higher levels of empathy. Now, um, turns out this is really hard um, and, and we've learned a lot. Um, um, one first challenge is that um, when we talk about empathy, kind of everybody has kind of a, a kind of a colloquial understanding or opinion about empathy. Really, what we want to capture here is is a clinically relevant construct of empathy, matching what clinical psychologists know and understand is very important. Um, it turns out that construct is very complex. Uh, it's a lot more than just positive sentiment or an emotional reaction. Uh, for example, the literature would highlight uh, very cognitive aspects of interpretation and explorations of feelings as well. Um, if you're a computer scientist and, and you kind of go out and, and, and look for data that you could use to better understand this, turns out there's no labeled corpora like this. Um, we very much want to empower people through, through learning and, and training, um, as you'll see later. So we would like to create explainable uh, predictions, uh, which is challenging. And lastly, we really want to make sure that when we um, give feedback, that this feedback is actionable. Kind of what could somebody concretely do to express empathy more uh, effectively? Um, so here we decided that we really want to give feedback in, in natural language. Um, in our case, English, but we want concrete, coherent language, which we know is complex, high dimensional and, and hard to generate well. Uh, we also want this to be context specific, meaning it's personalized to your situation and we only bother you when you actually need it. Um, and another thing that's really important is to make sure that these, um, uh, to kind of retain the natural diversity um, of people's conversation. It's a really meaningful human to human interaction here that we do not want to turn into kind of a very generic robotic template. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that uh, later in the talk as well. So um, what I, I will do today is um, we'll um, basically have two main parts uh, to this talk. Um, I will first tell you about um, uh, methods to better understand empathy. Um, so specifically, I will tell you about a framework uh, we developed, how to measure empathy, a uh, related data set uh, that is also available to you all, um, a machine learning model that can identify empathy in text. And then I'll tell you about what we were able to learn using this model and applying it to a very large online mental health platform. And then in the second part of the talk, we'll uh, start talking about giving feedback. Um, how can we help people Im improve empathy? Um, we, oops, um, uh, here I will share a uh, kind of a computational task, how we operationalized um, this giving uh, feedback um, part. I will tell you about a system called Partner, which is a reinforcement learning based model that um, can, can give this feedback. And I'll then uh, tell you about various um, forms of evaluation that we've done uh, to see whether uh, this feedback, kind of whether this model is successful, whether this feedback is very useful. Um, um, 
this, this paper just uh, received the best paper award at dub 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 and uh, we've been very very grateful for um, uh, that that kind of a recognition of our trusted colleagues so let's uh, get into the details let's start talking about uh, what empathy really is and how we can measure it um, and here um, like none of this would have been possible without kind of deep collaboration with uh, clinical psychologists. Uh, we had to understand how psychologists have, have thought for, for many, many decades about how to measure empathy. And then we adapted this to um, um, this online setting that is really text-based and not face-to-face -face and asynchronous. And in this framework, um, it turns out that there's kind of three main mechanisms or three main pillars of empathy. The first ones are emotional reactions. Um, um, this is about communicating the emotion experienced after reading someone's post. Um, the second one is interpretations, communicating your understanding of what they uh, might be going through, what their feelings are. Um, and third, explorations, uh, improving your understanding by exploring the feelings and experiences of others. And we decided that for each of these three mechanisms, we'll div uh, differentiate between three levels, kind of not expressing them at all, expressing them to kind of some degree, but a weak degree, and expressing them strongly. Um, and, and here's a couple examples. So let's stay with this uh, unfortunate situation uh, where somebody shares, my whole family hates me, I don't see any point in living. Um, somebody might respond, let me know if you want to talk. Um, definitely not the worst um, response, but it does not actively um, express empathy. Somebody might say, I understand how you feel. Uh, we would consider this a weak interpretation. It's not very specific. Um, somebody might say, everything will be fine. That's a weak emotional reaction. Or ask, what happened, question mark, uh, for a weak exploration. Again, not very specific. Here's a couple stronger examples. So for instance, saying, if that happened to me, I would feel really isolated. Uh, here I'm labeling and kind of really, kind of with more specificity, interpreting what the person might be going through. Um, I really hope things would improve, uh, would be a strong emotional reaction and saying something like, I wonder if this makes you feel isolated. Um, so again, a more specific way to explore what the other person might be feeling and going through. Now, based on this framework, uh, we defined um, uh, two prediction tasks and, and then uh, built a data set uh, to work on them. The first task is empathy identification. Um, it's essentially a, a three independent, three class classification problems for emotional reactions, um, interpretations and explorations. So concretely for the post here on the left, um, it's a weak interpretation. So it'll be a one out of two interpretation, a weak emotional reaction. So a one out of two emotional reaction and no exploration. And now uh, what I've highlighted here in red and blue um, this is uh, um, what we would call rationale extraction in, in NLP that's commonly called this way. So here we're interested in, in what is the supporting evidence for your classification of this potentially much longer response, where is empathy actually being actively communicated? I um, mean, this will help us uh, in terms of explaining predictions um, as well as for some other ideas um, later. So now uh, for this task, we collected a data set of, of 10,000 post and response pairs, um, um, including these rationales. Uh, they came from two different platforms, from TalkLife and various mental health subreddits. Um, I, in the previous Q&A, we, we share all the challenges around um, kind of elic eliciting a high quality annotation. And this is something that we had to and did uh, very majorly invest in. So specifically, we worked with multiple freelancers um, um, that we trained um, extensively. So through a series of phone calls, as well as manual and automated feedback, we, we trained them to do well on this task. Um, we know that people aren't automatically good at this. So this, is the whole, this is the whole kind of uh, premise of, of this work. And with that, we were able to achieve a, a fairly high inter-annotator reliability um, measured as a kappa of 0.69 here. And in this world of, of um, kind of language and mental health, um, uh, this, is, this is exceptionally high uh, relative to um, um, other work we've seen um, that, that really helped us understand that we really need to invest here. Um, 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 large parts of this data uh, we are allowed to make publicly available and you can find that at the website below. I'll also put this up later. 
So now, um, using this data set, we developed a computational model uh, for identifying empathy along with these uh, supportive evidences. So um, um, really what this is, is a multitask Roberta-based bi-encoder model, but I'll detail a little bit more what, what that means. So um, somebody might say, uh, kind of life sucks, I just lost my job. Somebody might respond, I understand how you feel. Uh, fairly short, but this is the example we'll work with here. Um, and uh, the model will take those two um, messages and then um, both predict, oh, this is a weak interpretation, uh, kind of the class label, as well as a binary mask uh, for the rationale. And this works by first tokenizing both messages, um, then independently uh, encoding them uh, through independently pre-trained Roberta-based encoders. Uh, those are transformer models and uh, then applying attention across both the, the seeker post as well as the response post, um, and then two heads for this um, multitask uh, classification. When we applied this model, um, the results were very encouraging. Uh, we were able to identify empathy with about 80% accuracy, 70% uh, F1 score. Again, a random baseline would be about 33% accurate um, given the, the three class classification ac um, problem. Um, this model, I won't go into detail here, actually it didn't depend on the exact evaluation task. Uh, this model outperformed many popular uh, NLP baseline models, like our favorite BERT, GPT-2, Dialog GPT models, etc. Um, and one thing I was particularly excited about, um, because I don't get to see that very often, is that uh, this model actually generalized across data sets very well with virtually no loss in performance. So when we trained on talk life and, and then um, tested on, on Reddit or vice versa, we had virtually the same performance. And, and what this is, um, this suggests that we can capture a more general and site independent empathy construct. Um, this matters to us because we, we really wanted to capture this meaningful clinical psychology construct of empathy and not just do something that seems to be specific to just kind of one particular platform. So now I'll tell you about what we were able to learn applying this model to a large um, online platform, specifically TalkLife. And what we did here is kind of this TalkLife platform is, is very large, millions of people use it. Uh, it's a social network, social media type platform. So there's lots of things happening on this platform that aren't exactly about mental health. I know discussing um, I know, pop culture, music, other events. Um, so what I'm going to show you is only on the subset of posts that were really sharing significant mental health challenges. And we felt strongly that those were the kind of types of interactions where it would be really useful to see some empathy. So what did we find? Um, first, um, it, uh, it appeared that our empathy construct really appears meaningful to talk live users. So here we look on the y-axis at the responses. How often are they liked? Um, depending on the empathy level. And if empathy is higher, um, they receive uh, a lot more likes. Um, this is true for emotional reactions and interpretations, but not explorations. However, explorations really keep the conversations alive and keep going. So stronger explorations uh, get about 50% more replies. So uh, this is showing that high empathy interactions seem to be received positively by seekers on this platform based on these uh, kind of social network proxies. Um, and um, this was exciting to see, kind of there's, there's no guarantee that whatever clinical construct actually would be meaningful to people on this platform, uh, but it looks like it is. Um, there was one more piece of evidence supporting this. Um, here we're looking at how likely are you to follow me uh, in kind of a social network following sense so we can keep, uh, keep uh, being connected afterwards if I reply to you with lots of empathy. And it turns out um, you're about 79% more likely to follow uh, someone after an empathic interactions. Um, and in the context of empathy, this is really meaningful uh, because this following is essentially a proxy for relationship forming. And uh, what we know from the literature is that um, um, what we uh, what empathy does is it helps form these relationships. And we were able to see this on this kind of large digital platform as well. 
Now for some of the more sombering uh, news. Um, unfortunately, we found that expressed empathy is fairly low. So if, if you add those three main mechanisms um, that are zero out of two, uh, you get a scale zero to six. And out of that scale, the average response would be at, at about one out of six empathy. Uh, that was a little less than we were perhaps hoping to see. Uh, we then were wondering, well, like it, it's complicated. Maybe people need some time to learn how to do this well. Does it actually improve over time? Um, if anything, the opposite is the case. Um, um, no matter how you slice and dice the data, you always find empathy stays the same or might even decrease. Um, this was also not great to see, but it, it turns out when we shared this with our clinical psychology collaborators, they were not surprised at all. Um, it turns out that um, without deliberate practice and specific feedback, even trained therapists often diminish in those types of skills over time. So really, um, th this wasn't surprising to them, but what this shows is um, the need for um, helping those people um, to, to be deliberate, to get specific feedback, um, and, and that's what I'll, I'll tell you about next. So I'll summarize briefly. Um, um, we were able to measure empathy uh, successfully and the measured components um, were predictive of positive outcomes on, on these platforms. Um, unfortunately, we found that empathic conversations are a lot more rare than probably would be useful. And um, um, there were lots of signs that um, we really want uh, actionable, specific empathy feedback or training to help people express empathy more effectively. So let's talk about uh, that part now. And um, um, this started uh, with us defining a new computational task based on rewriting uh, in order to think about how we can help somebody express empathy better. So in this um, empathic rewriting task, um, the goal is to computationally take a lower empathy conversational post and rewrite this to a higher level of empathy. So as an example here, um, somebody shares, I can't deal with this part of my bipolar, uh, I need help. Um, somebody might say, don't worry, try to relax, is there anybody you can talk to? Um, by the way, don't worry here might not be the best response. Uh, clearly the other person is already worrying about it. Um, it like that could come across as, as invalidating that person's feelings and a professional uh, therapist might, might do this differently. So now um, I'll tell you about an intelligent agent that will look at both of these kind of um, the first post and the current response and then rewrites this uh, to potentially something of, of higher empathy. For instance, saying um, being manic is no fun. It's actually really scary. I'm sorry to hear that this is troubling you um, and then keeping the rest of the of the message. Now, uh, we made some uh, deliberate decisions here. Um, we decided we will do this rewriting um, on a sentence by sentence level. And the actions that are available to us are either I can insert a new sentence somewhere or I might want to replace a sentence. Um, and this is not like this is without loss of gener generality, but it will help us structure our reinforcement uh, learning agent in, in just a few minutes. Now, um, turns out this, this is quite, quite challenging to do so. Um, 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 on the one hand, um, it's actually really easy. Um, um, for example, in, instead of whichever response there might be, what if we always said um, something like, um, I, I, I'm so sorry to hear that, um, this must have been really hard for you. Uh, this would probably already score above the average level. Um, but kind of transforming everything to this kind of super generic response is, is very unlikely to help. Um, it's not, it wouldn't be specific to the emotions and experience of the person you're talking to. Um, and our, our group actually showed um, on, a, on a different platform that people really appreciate this response diversity or really hate it when it becomes uh, quote unquote robotic. Um, there's a lot of similar work, uh, excellent work in, in natural language processing around style transfer. Um, but it turns out that this empathic rewriting here may be more complicated than our typical style transfer. For instance, a typical problem is sentiment transfer, uh, where instead of saying the movie was bad, I say it was good. Uh, here I just need to kind of change one adjective to another, and I, and I have kind of done this transferring task successfully. 
But in our case, we really need to add multiple new sentences and go much deeper than that. And the way um, this type of work is typically done is um, that you have parallel data sets, say not very empathic, much more empathic, um, but kind of very related and, and training machine learning models based on such parallel data. Now, um, um, this doing that, kind of creating one like this would definitely be expensive because we need domain experts. Uh, we need kind of sufficient scale. Uh, those type of models are very data hungry. And we know those domain experts are, are kind of far and few between um, and kind of very overloaded, especially right now. What I'll now tell you about is um, this system called Partner that is based on reinforcement learning to perform this rewriting task. And it can perform different editing actions and, and work with you on editing your posts. Um, and it will incorporate various objectives um, like specificity and diversity. And it will not need kind of a, a kind of um, um, kind of expensive parallel data set for trading. So, so we will change the type of challenges I just uh, discussed. All right, so in reinforcement learning, um, kind of we use the standard reinforcement learning uh, setting. Uh, this involves um, having a state and actions and a policy of which actions to take and rewards um, uh, for how good these actions were. Um, in our setting, um, um, our agent works on a conversation between the, the seeker and the peer supporter. Uh, from that, we will define a state. Based on the state, we will decide kind of which rewriting actions we want to take. Um, and then based on this um, kind of change, this action, we will get some reward depending on how good it was. And now I'll tell you uh, kind of more details about each of these parts uh, respectively. So the state um, is based on the seeker post and a, uh, a part of the response post in, in case they're, they're longer. And um, kind of that's, that's all we base the state on. Uh, we can then take uh, two actions. We can insert an empathic sentence or replace an existing sentence with a more empathic one. And really what's happening under the hood is first, um, we will select a position where in the current response do you want to take action? And then you have to generate the sentence that you want to place right there. Um, so this example, we might say, oh, we want to replace, don't worry. Um, we will then generate a candidate sentence, say, say being manic really is no fun. Um, and then we could uh, do that replacing action. Now, how our policy works is we would start with a seeker post and that response post, kind of the, or that partial um, contiguous sequence of the response post. Um, both then are passed uh, through a transformer language model that uh, predicts um, jointly both the kind of where, where, which position to do it, and what sentence to put right there. So say in this particular case, we would decide to put it at position zero, and we want to put there, um, I know how heartbreaking this must have been, um, so the rewritten response would now have that exact sentence at position zero. Now, based on this uh, new response, uh, we will um, gain some rewards. And um, here we really need a series of rewards uh, to ensure that we have highly empathic rewritings, but we also want to maintain um, proper English language and conversational properties like fluency, uh, specificity, and diversity. Um, so what, what rewards do we have? Um, of course, we have a change in empathy, kind of this is the primary goal. So is it more empathic afterwards than before? Um, we capture text fluency through the perplexity of the rewritten response. Uh, we capture sentence coherence, kind of do the sentence really make sense um, with each other or kind of do they even um, contradict each other? Um, and we have a mutual information-based reward uh, that ensures specificity and diversity. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this one because it's particularly interesting and it was, it was very useful. So um, essentially this mutual information um, part asks whether the seeker post and the generator's response share any information. From an equation perspective, it looks like this. Uh, really what's happening here is um, we wonder, can I take the seeker post and then generate my response? And then can I do the opposite? Can I take the response and then generate the seeker post again from that response? And this helps because um, um, it's not possible to take a very generic response, something like I understand how you feel, and, and generate the entire kind of original seeker post from it. 
and um, kind of this is how this can help you with specificity and diversity. Um, now, kind of, we, we still have the problem. Eventually, we need data to train uh, such a system, um, and, and this data is, is kind of not easily available. And uh, here we had an interesting idea that is um, actually based on, on some interesting work in AAAI by, by Weston Horvitz. Um, and the, the interesting thing about empathy is, um, it turns out it's hard to generate. Um, that, that's the problem we are having here. But it's actually much easier to destroy or, or to decrease empathy. And um, in the paper below, they have the same idea for, for humor. It's much easier to destroy a joke than to generate one. So here what we're doing is uh, we take an original response that is at least somewhat empathic. Um, based on our previous classifier, we can figure out, oh, this being manic is no fun, it is part of the expressed empathy. Um, then we can rip that sentence out, uh, just have the try to relax part. And now we actually have this parallel data set without kind of expert um, additional expert information. And this gives us a parallel data set that we can use as a warm start to our reinforcement learning based training. So um, um, specifically uh, for the training here, we used uh, the talk life data set. It has um, uh, kind of millions of posts and, and millions of responses. But we uh, again filtered this down to only the really kind of definitely mental health related kind of important conversations where we would want to see empathy. Uh, we end up with a few million posts after that. And then we take our empathy based classifier that I, I told you about in the first part of the talk um, and create this um, um, kind of proxy uh, parallel data set that we can then use for a warm startup for our model. Now, of course, the question is, how well does this work? Um, and we did a combination of automated and human evaluation. Um, and similar to kind of the previous Q&A and awesome, awesome work before, um, doing the kind of evaluation right and, and how to measure success is, is always a real challenge. And it is here also. Um, so specifically what we did is we, of course, measured uh, what was the change in empathy. Um, we measured the perplexity about for the fluency of the response whether the, the response was coherent, uh, whether it was specific uh, to the original post, the diversity, kind of do you always say the same thing? And we also evaluated the edit rate. Ideally, we would want to improve empathy while making as few changes as possible. Now, I, I don't have enough time to tell, tell you about all of these things, but I, I'll tell you the high level uh, findings here. Um, so specifically for the change in empathy, um, uh, we looked at various um, NLP baseline models like MIME or Dialog GPT or BART. Um, some of those are able to improve empathy, um, not all of them. Um, the model that we proposed was able to do that um, uh, uh, better. Uh, it would add about 1.6 points of empathy. So 1.6 points, what does that mean? Um, it's about 35% more than the best baseline method. Um, 1.6 points is actually quite a bit. Um, if you remember earlier, I told you that the average response was one out of six. So if this one gets a, a 2.6, we're actually adding about 160% more empathy than there would have been previously on the platform. Now, um, a technical detail for those interested in kind of the reinforcement learning part. Um, the reinforcement learning part is actually really important. If you only do the warm start without the reinforcement learning, you get about only half of, of this benefit. So what this shows is um, um, we outperform various baselines, and we can generate uh, fluent, specific, and diverse outputs with a lower number of edits, uh, even though I haven't really shown you the results uh, for that. Um, but you can find them in the paper, or we can uh, talk more later. It's really important uh, to do a human evaluation because these automatic metrics are you know, the, the best we have and often not particularly great. Um, what we did here is we recruited uh, graduate students in clinical psychology. Um, uh, recruiting students is actually really meaningful here because they just went through training. They should still remember well how to do this. Um, and then we did A-B testing. So I, I would show you two outputs, uh, one from our model, one from another model. I don't tell you which one is which. And then you have to kind of pick one of the two, which one is more empathic and which one is more specific. And here we see the results. And on the x-axis, we have kind of which one is preferred. So, so we, would, um, we would be very happy if, if um, things are above 50%, if kind of our model would be preferred um, um, above the baselines. Um, and that's what we find. 
independent of the baselines, uh, independent whether we're talking about specificity or empathy. Um, so um, kind of humans also preferred kind of these responses. And we also asked these um, experts to write kind of the, the best possible response they can come up with with lots of time and expertise. And uh, the, the responses we came up with had the highest overlap with those as well. Another thing that um, I believe is very important is that uh, this model can actually adapt to the current response. Um, what you see here is that the other baselines, if you already have a, a, a very highly empathic pose, like a four, five, six, we know this is rare, but what, what if you actually had a great um, empathic pose to start with? Um, our model partner um, just kind of understands that, backs off and, and doesn't do anything. But other models kind of tend to still try and really make things much worse. Um, and on the left side, you see that if there's no empathy currently present, our model can add um, the largest amount of empathy there as well. Now, um, um, we're super excited about these results. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of important considerations uh, to be made um, and to be evaluated properly before we would ever kind of consider deploying such a model. So um, uh, there's a lot we, we learned throughout this project. We, um, um, it's really important to co-design these type of systems with all stakeholders. Um, so with clinicians, mental health experts, platform designers, and of course the users of these type of systems. Um, um, AI systems may not always be reliable. Uh, we might generate feedback that could be unsafe. And this is a high stake situation of mental health support. And of course, we, we very much need to prioritize safety here and, and design mechanisms that can uh, minimize uh, uh, safety concerns. It's also really tricky to design the user experience in the right way, kind of what is actually the best way to give feedback to users. Um, I only have a partial answer to that. Um, we learned it's super important to kind of give transparency and control. Um, kind of people using these systems, they want to know why you're giving them feedback, why you're making these suggestions. Um, tell them about the benefits that kind of uh, those suggestions could, could have. And um, in, in this case, educate them about um, uh, empathy in the potential benefits. And um, it's also important for people that don't want to kind of interact with this type of technology to make it easy for them to opt out and, and kind of ignore this type of system. And lastly, I want to say um, um, we, we often hear this human in the loop uh, term in AI. Um, and at least in this case, I, I don't think this is very useful. Um, um, if anything, I think what's, what's much more useful here is thinking about AI in the loop um, on a backseat uh, with additional human supervision, um, because the key interaction here is really between two human beings, and this empathy between two human um, beings is is really what's what's is kind of at the at the center of this interaction. I'll um, show you one last thing, um, and then I look forward to the Q and A. We actually built such a system recently that gives real time feedback to Talk Live users, and, and here's how it works. So I, I might have a seeker post, and then I'm, I'm, I'm uh, on my phone typing out the response. Um, and, and if you if you want help or you wait a really long time, um, you will see kind of this pop up. Kind of, would you like some help? Uh, you can click on that, and uh, then it takes us a couple of milliseconds to run our deep learning models to give you some suggestions. And uh, this is the suggestions we generated in this case. Um, so the post read, "I hope I didn't lose my two best friends. They're the only ones I could relate to." Um, and we suggest, oh, you could say that's awful. Um, what happened between you two? And then add uh, what caused you two to break? Kind of a more specific exploration here. And then you can click on these, or you can ignore these, or you can get new feedback, or you can just kind of type or, or fix up your response. Um, and, and once you're done, and um, our model says kind of you did a great job with empathy, we also give this positive uh, feedback. Um, we're actually currently evaluating this in a, in a randomized controlled trial. Um, so here we have a control group um, that doesn't get feedback and a treatment group that will get feedback. Um, but we wanted to keep the bar very high. So both of these groups actually get a, a, an empathy training, kind of a static document that they work through with a couple examples for empathy. They both get that uh, training right before we ask them to write empathic responses. And then we look for the effect kind of if, if the treatment group had this intelligent in the moment, real time, hopefully actionable feedback, 
um, would the treatment group have higher levels of empathy, uh, kind of beyond kind of a very simple, uh, kind of in a much cheaper uh, training probably. And um, I, I do want to caution, kind of this is preliminary results from an ongoing trial, has not been peer reviewed, um, um, but we're kind of starting to see kind of pretty significant results and are getting excited. Um, so what we're finding here on the left is um, we have the group with feedback on the right, without feedback on the left. And what we see is that empathy improves for all these different groups of users. And it, it improves particularly well for, for people that find it challenging to write empathic responses. That makes sense. Uh, it turns out about 80% of people on the platform find it very challenging. And, and for them, we see about a 70% improvement of empathy um, when they get uh, kind of this, when they can work with this intelligent agent to, to express more empathy. All right, uh, let me summarize and, and then I, I look forward to the Q&A as well. Um, um, I told you about empathic conversations that are crucial for mental health support. Unfortunately, they're expressed rarely. Um, I told you about new prediction tasks and data sets um, for facilitating empathic conversations, um, including this rewriting task, um, models for that based on reinforcement learning, for example, and how those models might be able to give intelligent and actionable feedback um, uh, that might actually be effective um, uh, from what we're seeing. And clearly there's so much more we can do as well. Uh, thanks everybody. Um, again, a shout out to the big team that made this possible. Thanks to our funders that made this possible. And if you're interested in any parts, there's videos, papers, codes, models, and data uh, all available at, at this website um, if, if this may be uh, useful to you. Um, with that, uh, thank you all again. Uh, thanks for, for being with me at the end of the day. Uh, and I look forward to, to your questions. I muted. Thank you, Tim. That was a great talk. We have time for questions now. Ah, there is already one question. Uh, let me allow you. Matt, you can ask your question now. You should, no, you are still not. Hi, Tim. Okay. Uh, this is uh, fascinating work. Uh, one of my previous jobs was training people in peer support. Um, oh, awesome. yeah. <laughs> have, have you got any plans to uh, apply this to the therapist patient conversations? Yep, um, uh, great, great question. So um, to give a little bit more context, this, this is a really important question. Um, we're starting to see some of the potential benefits um, and applying this to um, kind of doctor patient interactions, especially kind of trained clinical psychologists is also meaningful. Like, like we know, like without specific feedback, um, they may deteriorate in these skills over time. Um, however, um, the bar is much higher. Like, like those people have undergone professional training. Um, they may not kind of, they may be sometimes be able to do better. Um, kind of, there's lots of evidence that that's the case. How, however, they're, they're really doing um, a much different and, and better job than your average peer supporter without training that may even be struggling with mental health uh, situations themselves um, on these platforms. So, uh, we are very interested in this. We, we actually just um, a few weeks ago started collaborating with a company that uh, has professional uh, support uh, kind of through an online app as well. Um, um, there's not much I can tell you about that yet, um, but we do expect that there's kind of significant differences in, in, in kind of how those people act, um, how empathy is being expressed. Kind of one key aspect of that difference is it's kind of a different conversation. Kind of this, this platform I showed you, um, I, I, I think is really meaningful, but, but they tend to be fairly short, quick, kind of online social media-esque interactions. Um, it's, it's a little bit like, like imagine Twitter for mental health support. Um, it's less kind of meeting your, your, your therapist for an hour every week and having a, a long-term relationship, um, deep long-term conversations. Um, so there may also be differences in how empathy is expressed in, in that scenarios. Um, so that's specifically something we're, we're looking into now. Um, um, I, I don't have much to share, share uh, about that, um, um, but there, there certainly seems to be interest in, in, in these type of tools. Um, and, and we're talking to various organizations and, and clinical psychologists to, to figure out how, how this may be useful. 
Um, the, the bar kind of the, the bar is higher, and uh, especially what that means for data collection and data quality. Um, I, I, I think those are, are significant associated challenges with that as well. Um, um, awesome, you've been trading uh, via Cerberus. Tim, if you unshare your screen, um, then it would be nice. We can see each other on a bigger. Um, so if I do what? Uh, if you just unshare your content. So just, oh, I'm just still sharing. I Oops, I, I thought I'd done this already. Is it gone now? Yes. Yes. Very good. Uh -huh. Excellent. OK, uh, figure, figure, figured out teams at last. Sometimes that's the largest <laughs> challenge. Yeah. Marcel, you can ask your question now. Marcel, we cannot hear you. So you're not muted, but I also can't hear anything yet. OK, maybe he tries to log in again. Uh, we can go with the next question from Sonam. Ah, OK, Marcel is back. Marcel, uh, I'll, I'll again unmute you. OK, I need to find you. Sorry for that. Marcel, if you... Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I, I can, can hear you. you. Okay. Um, I have a question regarding the uh, reinforcement learning. Um, in reinforcement learning, it's really difficult to uh, yeah, engineer your, um, your state and action pairs. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more about how you... Um, yeah, designed as a state for mm -hmm. the reinforcement learning. Yeah, um, and you're absolutely right. Those um, those tools can be rather finicky in, in getting them to work uh, in a consistent way. Um, I, I think it's certainly a, a big part of the challenge. Um, regarding the state, um, the, the state is based on the seeker post as well as um, a, a window of the response post. Could be everything if it's short, but could be only a part. Uh, when it's very large, um, um, and then kind of uh, this is piped through a large transformer-based language model, uh, GPT-2, um, um, kind of starting with a pre-trained uh, model that then gets fine-tuned in, in the process. So kind of starting with a, a kind of language is super complex. Now we want to do that with reinforcement learning. Kind of definitely starting with a pre-trained model kind of gets you in a, in a better place earlier. Um, another detail was kind of using these small windows rather than the uh, kind of looking at the entire post at once seemed to help in practice a lot to get more consistent results. So the model essentially has kind of less to think about. We just look kind of at two sentences at the time. Um, at some point we get to kind of figure out, do we want anything in the beginning? At another point I get asked like, oh, do you want to add anything in the end? Um, in, in practice, this seemed to help. Um, there's some plausible reasons for this because um, in this empathy, often you would start with an emotional reaction. I'm so sorry to hear that. And you would end in a question and in an exploration like what happened to between you two? Um, and so, so there's kind of naturally you would do different things at different times and that encoding that uh, seemed to help. Um, I honestly think we could have done better on encoding the states than, than we did. For example, making it easier for the model to to kind of have the empathy classification available at all times, kind of that's happening implicitly in kind of the natural language representation. Um, but it kind of felt in retrospect that we were asking maybe a little bit too much from the model and could have made that part easier. Um, on um, and, and then the rewards are, are, are key as well. Um, so we had kind of multiple rewards. Um, there, there are definitely trade-offs um, between them. So for instance, it's super easy to have high empathy if you don't require any diversity. I tell you the same thing every time. Um, st still do better uh, th than we're doing before, but we um, there's very good reasons not to do that. So so kind of having kind of good good proxies kind of in like automatically being able to measure these types of um, kind of rewards in a meaningful way. Um, it, it's another challenge. And I think then the third key idea to this reinforcement learning was this warm start. Like there, there's no kind of great data set of kind of um, I know, uh, professionals taking a million posts, rewriting them to something better. 
Um, and it would be super expensive to do that. Uh, we did that for the evaluation. That was um, um, I don't know, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, um, but the kind of the, the nice idea there that we borrowed from from our, our friends working on humor was you can take um, an empathic response if you can recognize it, take out the empathic part, and you create your parallel data set. Might not be quite as high quality, um, but but it helped a lot in kind of warm starting the model in kind of a more parallel supervised setting before getting into um, all the reinforcement learning. That said, um, I only flashed the numbers really quickly. If you don't add the reinforcement learning at the end, you only get about halfway of the empathy response. So kind of adding the reinforcement learning part in the end was very helpful. Um, and to kind of make this response even longer, um, um, the, the reinforcement learning um, I, I think is helpful not only about the quality of the responses, but bef be because it, it helps us um, capture these very discrete actions. I, I can take a sentence out, I can replace it, I can insert one somewhere. It's, it's very discrete and it helps us um, also have much less edits. So um, other kind of sequence to sequence models that, that uh, you might apply might just always rewrite everything. Um, if, if you're working with a human being um, who should, kind of is in charge and kind of what they're actually kind of going through is, is meaningful, um, kind of telling them kind of like, oh, let, let's scratch everything you just wrote and let me put something else there. It's just not a good way to, to actually enter this conversation and, and help this interactions. But doing kind of these kind of um, small edits in key places based on kind of these discrete actions of the reinforcement learning agent, I, I think were really key to the, um, the um, kind of whatever is working well, I, I think is partially uh, due to that. Okay, thank you, thank you really much. It was really interesting. Thank you. Niloy, you can go ahead. Hi, Tim. It was a great talk. So I just have a question. Uh, isn't empathy very cultural? Means in some cases, what is empathy may be inclusiveness in other cultures. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and um, the, the, I think this is kind of a key area of your future work as well. Um, um, there, there's lots of evidence that this is the case. Um, I, I can't say that I understand every culture on the planet well enough, um, but when we looked and, and learned about empathy, for instance, in the uh, academic literature, you will find that in Japan, there's uh, very clear evidence that uh, empathy and kind of interactions are, are very different. Um, so clearly, whatever I've shown you is, is um, likely biased towards kind of a, a Western um, um, perhaps also English speaking and perhaps even more views. Um, the platform is fairly large. It's used by people in, in dozens of countries, uh, including non-Western countries. Um, but it's it's kind of largely English speaking. We only focus on English speaking contents. Um, and, and that certainly brings all kinds of selection effects and biases with it. Um, 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 I, I think honestly, I think this is a complicated question and kind of being able kind of what I showed you was in part enabled by having these large data sets. Um, but I know, for example, in, in, in India, there's uh, some folks at uh, Microsoft Research uh, doing uh, very awesome work on actually on the same platform, um, comparing how um, uh, users in India are, are different from other users and, and going deeper on, on some of these questions. And um, also within the US and uh, United States and I know, very Western um, American culture, there might be differences as well, for instance, between kind of race and ethnicity in which other, other, other factors matter. And um, we, we just got um, uh, one of the grants behind this work uh, renewed to, to, to work with some um, uh, folks on, on, on some of these questions as well. Um, it's it's a, a, a absolutely well taken and appropriate point. Um, so just to give an example, like say in India, telling thank you is many times considered as rude. Mm -hmm. so it's a very culture specific thing many times, yeah. I think we have time for one last question from Sonam. I have so to be I'm careful. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. I have to be careful thank saying you so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from India, but I, I really don't think saying thank you is rude. 
but again yeah as uh, <laughs> specifically said it's like quite different quite subjective that's true so i appreciate the tra transformer like uh, model that has been used uh, for training so uh, probably the named entity recognition should be like taken care of a bit more specifically probably you know if we can classify the training data uh, depending on the mental health condition type like for example there might be the, the mental health condition might be because of like substance abuse or um, you know alcohol abuse on one side it might be because of schizophrenia or like uh, ocd or something other like that so probably if if we can we, if we can classify these training data and then uh, depending on that train the model probably the peer to peer interaction would be a bit more uh, specific uh, what are your views on that yeah yeah a uh, great point and, and thank you for the question as well <laughs> i hope it's not rude um um part about your question kind of like it, it it um suggests that there's lots of other things we can do to make these um, conversations better um I, I think that's correct um for example there's a lot more um, than empathy that might matter um, we very specifically focused on empathy. Um, we spent quite some time kind of thinking about what is the right kind of um, um, like what's the right way of how we might be able to help. Do we want to work on empathy or something else? Uh, for instance, um, um, reflective listening, complex reflections, um, or or cognitive distortions and reframing cognitive distortions are, are some of the kind of other other things counselors and therapists do. Um, that are that are fairly basic and, and they're really kind of true across um, all kinds of conditions. So we also very intentionally picked empathy because it was um, a very central construct that is always relevant. Uh, it's also often the first step. So this kind of uh, relationship building, alliance rapport, is, is very important. Um, kind of how clinical psychologists talk about it is kind of first I have to build a relationship and, and then we can kind of really start doing the work and, and kind of do much more than just empathy. Um, um, but getting there is off, often a challenge. Um, so we kind of intentionally chose empathy, but there's so many other things you could do, um, um, including everything you said. And, and, and what, what you said kind of reminded me a lot. Um, it, essentially, we're getting into kind of more personalizing the interventions. The intervention here is actually language. Um, I, I think it's, it's fascinating to think about language as behavior and language as interventions. Um, unfortunately, it's a very large space of, of potential interventions, um, giving rise to kind of various computational and interesting challenges. Um, but for instance, like not talking to everybody in the same way, for instance, based on kind of what they're actually struggling with um, is, a, is a perfectly reasonable thing to do uh, that could benefit from, from the types of techniques um, you're bringing up. Um, um, in another project we recently kicked off, we're, we're working on, on this personalization um, um, of interventions. It's kind of a very long term study, but the idea there is kind of based on everything I, I could know about you following the conversation. Um, can I identify kind of different risk points, um, kind of issues with engagement? Uh, the previous Q&A talked a lot about motivation. Can we identify this, see where people might fall through the cracks and then find the right kind of interventions um, um, that, a, that a therapist could do to kind of help this process uh, uh, along in the way that's best for, for the client or patient or whatever we might want to call them. Um, and I, I, I'm super excited about this direction. I, I think there's a lot we could do. Um, it has a lot to do kind of with the previous question about how do you learn a proper state of everything that's going on based on all this heterogeneous information to make predictions which type of interventions might be more, more useful. Um, but I'm very excited about this particular project because we'll actually uh, try to test this out and, and um, we're in a setting collaborating with uh, various organizations to be able to use intelligent models to suggest interventions and see whether anything gets better rather than, for instance, uh, randomly assigning them or, or doing kind of the status quo type type treatment. Um, I, I think it, it's such a kind of open open direction um, kind of that, that you're bringing up. Um, and um, we kind of chose empathy as kind of the first steps um, um, and, and clearly there are um, many, many more. Um, uh, thank and you for that question. Also, you talked about you know, implementing an app, a mobile app or a web app in this regard. So that's really a fantastic idea because uh, you know, with the pandemic hit uh, quite hard in uh, most of the countries, uh, the e-learning industry has really taken off. So you know, we could use the same kind of model in, uh, in health education as well. 
and also like uh, helping a peer to peer uh, empathy building this model so uh, probably you know when you train the model uh, you could have different modalities for patients for caregivers for uh, and also for therapists and other professionals uh, probably they would look at the problem in a different way and that might help in uh, training the model uh, in a more efficient way uh, that's the thought that i had yeah um absolutely and i think what you bring up um getting feedback on conversations is something that um lots of areas could could potentially be useful education i think is a useful like any amount of tutoring um um um, that's an area we're also very excited about. There's also areas in, in marketing, kind of how, how do you change your messaging in order to get different goals? Kind of, there's lots of kind of conversations with key outcomes type setting. Um, I, I, I also teach, um, I also uh, get to men mentor awesome researchers, right? Like in all of these situations, um, uh, I, I'd love to figure out kind of what's the intervention to, to kind of help you kind of do the, the best work you can. Um, uh, and it, I, I think it's potentially relevant to kind of a lot of these uh, these type of cases. Um, thank you, sir. Yeah, thank, uh, you. thank you all. Being the chair, I just take advantage and ask you a very quick class question. <laughs> yeah. um, in, 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 in the reinforcement learning module, right? So exploration is also a very important factor. Uh, do you do some tricks to 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 improve the? I mean, what kind of exploration strategy that you use? Uh, is it is it kind of uniform or is it more? Uh, because once you have these mutual uh, information objectives, then this exploration is very very biased, right? So, uh, do you do mm -hmm. you do special tricks to allow your system to explore well? Um, it's a really great question. Um, I. Uh, in some level, I, I think the, the tricks we, we applied um, that helped us uh, relative to the previous questions as well. Um, for instance, like doing this warm start, kind of having these kind of parallel data sets and so on. Um, but but um, I think thinking more about your questions, I think all of those tricks really do more biasing yes. than more exploration. Um, yeah. um, um, I... It's it's a very interesting question. I th this hasn't been as much of a problem. I could imagine it might become more of a problem if you now want to do kind of again much better and again much better. For instance, with the earlier questions about now let's bring this to the level of kind of trained clinical psychologists. Now kind of like um, kind of inductive biases can can be useful, but only if they're the right ones. Um, so they they helped us get get at a certain level of performance. Um, mm -hmm. And we didn't really um, observe the, the type of problem about exploration that you brought up. Um, in fact, we were kind of trying so hard to bias it in the right direction. And I, I think in part, this, this might have to do, because kind of this is kind of language generation, um, I can't even tell you kind of how, how high dimensional the space is, um, yeah. very. Um, um, perhaps, like I, I could imagine that, that it's partially due to that, that the space is so high dimensional generating language can be so all over the place that you kind of naturally have, you tend to have more exploration than you might want. Um, um, it, so at least at this current state and, and kind of level of, of the systems working, um, maybe there's a lot more benefits to, to reap by kind of more biases, more biases just in the right direction. Um, um, but uh, I think it's, it's absolutely plausible that, that this will uh, this will end in, in helping these systems really explore in the right way um, will certainly become more important. I, I imagine it, it's partially um, kind of how, how much more do you want to squeeze out the model? Kind of the more I think the more you would rely on 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 kind of more and more exploration to really find the the right ways of doing it. Um, um, yeah, I, I think it's a fascinating question. I, I suspect that um, the better, the, the 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 further we go, the more important this discussion will really become. Um, Maybe like humans, these models also need a curiosity concept, right? So a kind of a curiosity part, which allows it to make more mistakes. Yeah, I, I think I think that's totally fair. Um, it, it really also I think depends on the context and the data set uh, you're mm -hmm. working with. Yeah. Um, so in um, in in this um, um, kind of privileged context of, of being able to work with kind of tens of millions of messages, some of which are amazing, some of which really aren't amazing. Kind of there's a lot of exploration done for you in in a way. Or like this mm -hmm. this is not an agent that um, I don't know. Um, 
um, but like this is this is not kind of language learning, you know, trying to imitate a child's language learning, starting from nothing and then building it up, um, where you really have to kind of explore so much more. Um, kind of starting with kind of a, a database of, of tens of millions of messages and some understanding of what might be empathic and what isn't, um, um, I think really helps. And this might as might have helped us dodge the the challenge you're bringing up. And, and kind of clearly, we won't always have this much data. Um, kind of especially the the higher levels of expertise you want, you will have less and less data. Um, uh, but I, I suspect that this really helps. And and um, I think in this kind of general kind of I know AI data science machine learning for for mental health type type, type world here, um, um, it, it's really hard to do counseling and therapy well. Uh, you only see uh, maybe a couple dozen cases of of the people you're treating. Um, but there are these huge databases of, of 20 million other cases. Probably there's one that's pretty similar that I probably could learn from. So, so I, I do think that there's kind of an important space for that as well. Um, mm -hmm. I know similar to kind of any retrieval task uh, any of us has worked on, like there's there, there might be ways to kind of get that knowledge at your fingertips. Um, at, at the same time, I, I um, um, nobody asked about kind of the exploration before. I think this is a very fascinating. I'm, I'm curious what. Um, um, what what we'll learn in, in that direction. I'm looking forward to your future work in that direction. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Tim. Thanks for the great talk and, and the nice discussion that followed. Um, this is the end of our uh, second session, and uh, we will come back again tomorrow at 9 a.m. with our third session on uh, medical data text mining. There will be the fourth session starting 3 p.m. tomorrow that would be on epidemiology. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you there and many more. Have a great day. Have a great evening. Bye bye. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.